someone in the distant West once said that if a person with great power only contemplates when evil is already done, then they are no different than evil itself. A young soldier with long dark hair rests after a long battle, covered in wounds and blood, holding his halberd. At the young man's feet lay the bodies of his enemies. Exhausted from the fight, he falls to his knees, saying that the battle had been very tedious. The young man turns his gaze and sees a woman with white hair and red eyes approaching from the hill, riding a large white deer with long fur. Inside himself, the young man wonders if she is an enemy. He doesn't want to fight her, but he knows he has to. On a high mountain, a boy is resting when he is about to be attacked by a large bear. The enormous bear with bulging and smiling eyes wakes the boy, calling him Bira, hugging him, and licking his face while asking for breakfast for herself and her cubs. The boy grumbles because he doesn't feel like going to get food for the cubs, looks up, and in the distance, sees black smoke rising from the mountains. The boy is curious about the smoke and remembers that his grandparents once told him that black smoke meant a fire. He leaves the mountain and heads toward the river to fetch food for the bears, ignoring the strange smoke in the distance. The mother bear and her cubs bid farewell to the boy, asking for many fish for their cubs, and the boy says goodbye to them, saying that today's breakfast will be fried fish and asking them to make sure to prepare the firewood. In the forest, the soldier from earlier is escaping from one of the subordinates of that beautiful woman. But he is attacked while escaping by this strange creature hidden inside its jars and using the others to attack him. It taunts the soldier and begins to hunt him for fun. The enemy takes out a trident from his jar and attacks the soldier. The soldier, riding a deer, defends himself using his long halberd and delivers a final blow to one of the enemy's jars. Unfortunately, the enemy was not in the jar he destroyed, and instead, dozens of snakes emerge from the remains of the jar and attack the young soldier. The boy manages to free himself from the attacking snakes but not before being bitten by some that inject their venom into him, while the mysterious creature hidden in the other jars mocks him. Meanwhile, at the river, Bira catches many fish, complaining about the bear's behavior and warning that they will have to deal with him when they grow up, thus catching many fish. Due to the large number of fish he caught from the river, he has no way to carry them up the mountain. At that moment, the horrible monster appears from the forest, and the boy are locked in a fight. The soldier falls into the river after blocking the creature's trident, and it surrounds him with its jars, saying that if he can find which jar it is in, his death will be less painful. The creature starts spinning with its jars around the boy, saying that this is his last chance. When the creature stops spinning, we see Bira standing on the jar where the creature is. She asks to borrow one of its jars to take her fish home, completely ignoring that they are in the middle of a life and death struggle. Taking advantage of Bira's distraction, the boy takes his weapon and decides to attack the jar where the creature is, warning the boy to be careful. The boy manages to strike the jar with his halberd, breaking it, and we see the creature reveal its form outside of the jar. It is a horrible monster with blue skin, orange eyes, a pair of horns, and snakes coming out of its back. While holding its trident, it looks into the boy's eyes and says, this one doesn't count because it was not he who found it inside the jars, and because of that, he will have a painful death. The monster orders them to fight within an illusion, causing both boys to enter a trance, and their eyes change color to orange. Due to the monster's powers, the boy falls into an illusion, recalling part of his past when he was a child. He remembers a time when he and a friend had stolen a bottle of wine to drink together later. Both children were on top of a mountain, and one of them drank all the wine while the other complained about not saving any for him, as they had both taken risks to steal it. Returning to reality, the monster was already celebrating its victory when Bira freed herself from the mind control and began to speak with the horrible monster as if nothing had happened. Bira started scolding the boy for destroying the monster's jars. Confused by the situation, the creature tried to silence Bira so she wouldn't wake the boy from the hallucination. Due to the commotion caused by these two, the boy broke free from the hallucination and protected the boy from the monster's attack. The monster lunged at them to attack, and the boy used his halberd to launch an attack, cutting off one of the creature's feet. The monster recoiled in pain as it had lost a foot. Bira didn't understand what was happening and didn't realize that the monster wanted to kill them. The other boy told her to leave immediately and then collapsed on the ground due to the effects of the poison. Both opponents were lying on the ground, one poisoned and the other having lost a foot. Bira tried to take advantage of the situation to escape and avoid getting further involved in this problem. A horrible creature, in a mocking tone, asked Bira to please continue writhing since this was her way of paying for the sin of aiming her weapon at its leader. Suddenly, the monster pulled a flute out of its nose and began to play it, 
causing numerous snakes to emerge from the remaining jars. From the three jars, many snakes emerged, forming a sort of tentacles. The boy with the halberd got up and grabbed Bira to get her out of the danger zone. The situation didn't seem to overwhelm Bira in the slightest. She was more concerned about delivering the bear's food on time than the fight she was caught up in. The horrible creature started regenerating its severed foot until it was completely restored and blew the flute harder, making the snake tentacles go straight for the boys. The boy, dodging the attacks, saw Bira lying unconscious, thinking that she had been bitten by the snakes. He made it his goal to end the fight and take him to the nearest hospital. On the other hand, Bira was only pretending to be unconscious, hoping to find the best opportunity to escape. With the halberd in one hand and Bira in the other, the boy began to cut the snake tentacles to make a path. In her mind, Bira considered bringing some snakes to the bears for them to eat, but she dismissed the idea, thinking they would probably complain about the taste. The poison acted again on the boy, causing both of them to fall into the water without the strength to get up at that moment. They began to drown in the river, even though the water wasn't very deep. The boy got up from the water only to see the horrible monster launching itself towards them to attack with its trident. To avoid the trident's impact, he decided to shield Bira with his body, intercepting the trident's path. But before the trident could hit them, a strange force destroyed it and pushed the monster away from them. The boy, unaware of what was happening, took advantage of the situation to escape the battle and ensure Bira's safety who was still pretending to be unconscious. After being pushed away by the strange force that protected the boys, the monster became angry and remembered the moment when its leader had let the boy's prisoner go. It saw the leader's expression of sadness and pain when letting him go, and this boy had taken one of the leader's belongings. The creature, angry and determined to finish off the boy with the halberd, began to blow its flute with even greater force, causing more snakes to emerge from its jars, forming a kind of tentacles. Finally, the horrible creature introduced itself as Kulan of the sect, the demon of the northern sky. While they were escaping from Kulan, the boy experienced paralysis again due to the snake venom. He fell into the not-so-deep water, almost drowning Bira, who was pretending to be unconscious. This happened several times in a somewhat comical manner, but because of it, they were caught by Kulan who rode on his snakes as if they were a wave. Hulan, who was on top of his snakes, mocked the boy because he couldn't handle the effects of the poison and launched an attack against both of them to finish them once and for all. He made all his snakes attack the boy together, and the boy loudly said that he thought it was a hallucination, which made Bira stop pretending and tell him that it wasn't in an alarmed tone. The boy was relieved to see that Bira was okay, knowing that if it wasn't a hallucination, it wouldn't last long. So, he threw Bira into the forest and told her to escape, that he would give her enough time to be safe. Here is where he introduced himself as Tanu and said that his name would be buried here to ensure that Bira could escape safely. He apologized for involving her in his fight and told her to go without looking back. Bira didn't hesitate and escaped from the place, saying, Okay. The tentacles lunged at Tanu, and he destroyed them with his halberd. Before falling to his knees due to the poison and exhaustion, Tanyu removed the object from his head, the same one he had taken from the sect leader or had been given by her. However, Kulan, not knowing what had happened, thought that Tanyu had stolen it and tried to punish him for making his leader feel bad. Tanyu lamented as he held the accessory, regretting not being able to confirm his best friend's death. On his knees and without the energy to fight, he accepted his fate and told Kulan that the fight was already over and to end his life like a true warrior. Kulan mocked him and said he was having a lot of fun and would give him a painful death, all because of the crime of aiming his weapon at the leader and taking an accessory that belonged to her. Tanyu fell to the ground, surrounded by snakes all over his body. Kulan approached to take the accessory, and out of nowhere, Bira appeared. Kulan told the boy to leave if he didn't want to get hurt by his snakes. Bira ignored what he said and warned him in a more serious tone to leave. She said that if he chose to ignore her warning, she would not be responsible for what happened. All this while Bira's eyes turned purple, and she made the leaves around her float. Kulan felt the great power emanating from Bira and realized that it was the boy who had destroyed his trident moments ago, causing him to panic. Bira took a strong step forward and dark star-shaped orbs appeared around her, heading toward Kyulun. Filled with fear, Kyulun tried to shield himself from Bira's attack. He closed his eyes, and a breeze was the only thing that touched him. When he opened his eyes, he realized that Bira had escaped with Tanyu's body, and in anger, he decided to leave. Meanwhile, in a city among the mountains, with lots of smoke and ancient Chinese-style houses, a young boy with somewhat long red hair was writing a letter when a tree leaf fell onto his writing. 
This was strange because he was on top of a tower. He showed a slight annoyance and felt a familiar breeze. He wondered if something interesting was about to happen. Inside the room, the boy transformed into an owl and flew out of the room, saying that the hot spring city he was in would soon receive a very respectable guest. The boy transformed into a bird heads toward the location where the confrontation with Kyulin took place, as he had sensed the energy caused by the Blood Blades, an ability that Bira used to escape from the battle. This power belonged to the Iron Blood Demon, a human with dark powers who was defeated nine years ago by his older brother. The young boy recalls the history of the battle between these two brothers. The older brother wore white clothing and had a sword in each hand. He was chasing after his younger brother, who was fleeing, shouting and reproaching him for everything he had done. He told him that no matter how many tears he shed, his sins would not be forgiven, and he wouldn't allow him to escape alive. He launched an attack against his younger brother, who also wielded two swords, but he was dressed in dark clothes and blocked the older brother's attack. Both brothers were quite advanced in age, with their hair and beards completely white. The one dressed in black was missing an eye. After stopping his attack, the younger brother reproached the older one, saying that calling his younger brother his greatest enemy was simply too much, all while having a smile on his face. The older brother denied being his brother anymore, and the other replied that whether he saw him as a brother or not was something he no longer cared about. The older brother, losing patience, launched a very powerful attack against his brother. The younger one asked him if gouging out an eye would be acceptable, just as the older brother had done to him. He also launched a dark attack against his brother. As both attacks collided, they exchanged positions, and tears flowed from the older brother's eyes while blood flowed from the younger brother's eye. Then, the younger brother fell into the chasm of stone columns with a hole in the middle caused by the older brother's attack. With his last words, he told his brother that when he got angry, he looked quite benevolent and advised him to take care before dying and falling into the great abyss. Back in reality, the young boy began to analyze the situation and thought that possibly the demon had come back to life. Meanwhile, after the embarrassing defeat, Kulin withdrew to collect his jars and realized that one of them was missing. He remembered that Bira had asked for a jar to carry her fish before Tanyu destroyed the jar she was in. Indignant at the defeat, he entered his jar and left so that his leader wouldn't find out about such a shameful defeat. At sunset, the boy who had transformed into a bird arrived at the site, but it was too late. The traces of the magic that Bira had used had already vanished. He saw the trail of colon snakes and mentioned that the energy of the Iron Blood Demon and the Northern Sky Demon sect together in one place was something very interesting. The leader of the sect, who had also headed to the battle site, watched as the young boy flew away. The strange creature he was riding referred to the boy as the master of H. Wamagwan. The young leader's elderly deer commented that it was the first time he had seen Kulin lose, and she replied that a higher force must have intervened in the battle. Changing the subject, the elderly deer mentioned that he had never seen her so interested in a prisoner to the point of letting him go with one of her accessories, and they both seemed to be of the same age for marriage. The girl asked him to stop talking about that topic, or she would have to go on her own. The elderly deer apologized to his leader, saying that he was naturally a curious creature. On top of the mountain, we see Tanyu's body resting. He wakes up and notices the aroma of fried fish. When he looks around, he sees a giant bear eating fish in front of a campfire. Tanyu thinks he is dead and that in heaven, bears cook their own fish. The large bear sees him and tosses him one of its fish to eat. The mother bear gets up and takes her cubs away, revealing that Bira was behind her, eating her fish. In other words, Tanyu had not died, and Bira tells him to eat quickly before his food gets cold. Thinking he had died in battle, he feels relieved to have saved the boy before dying. Then, he looks around and sees a large bear sitting by a campfire, eating. The bear offers Tanyu a fish to eat. Tanyu thinks the bear is some kind of god and accepts the fish it gave him. The large bear gets up, and its cubs, which were also eating, climb onto its back as they decide to take a stroll. As the bear moves, it reveals Bira, who was also eating with them. Tanyu apologizes to Bira for not enduring the battle longer and for causing his death. Bira asks him if he's out of his mind and suggests he eat before the food gets cold. Tanyu realizes at that moment that he's not dead and is surprised to find no wounds or traces of Kulin's poison on him. In his mind, Bira says that level of poison was nothing to him. The great bear turns out to be the same mother bear with her cubs that we saw at the beginning of the story, sent by Bira to get some fish to eat. Tanyu thinks the mother bear saved them and bids her farewell with respect, believing her to be the god of the forests. Tanyu wants to offer something to the bear, feeling indebted, but Bira thinks in his mind that Tanyu didn't hit his head but is just an idiot. Tanyu searches through his clothes and finds a bottle of wine to give to the bear, but it's gone. 
Dira looks at the bottle with astonishment and a desire to drink it. Tanyu tells him it's a bottle of wine and that he wanted to share it with someone special to him. Dira, wanting to have a sip of the wine, asks him to give it to him since he's very close to the god of the mountain and will give it to the god on his behalf. Tanyu tells him no, as he's still too young to drink alcohol. Indignant, Bira calls him stingy for using the excuse of being an adult and labels him as such. Tanyu starts to remember the days of his childhood. In his memories, he called Bira Soul, and on that day, they had stolen the wine to have a toast to celebrate their adulthood. Soul gets drunk, drinking all the wine, saying he understands why adults like it, and suddenly starts crying, asking Tanyu if he's really leaving the next day. To ease his friend's pain, Tanyu gives him a forehead accessory as a gift with the promise to return it when he becomes famous. Tanyu recalls his childhood friend with joy. When he stops reminiscing, he realizes that the wine bottle has disappeared, and Bira, on the other hand, has drunk it all. Bira drinks the entire bottle and gets drunk immediately, repeating the same words Soel said when he got drunk. He realizes this and starts acting calmer in front of Bira. The latter falls backward and ends up rolling until he bumps into Tanyu's back. Bira advises him that in any dangerous situation, he should first think about saving himself rather than others and should not say things like I will save you. Tanyu apologizes for worrying him, and Bira tells him it's already done, and he doesn't need to worry. For a moment, he gave the impression of being a trustworthy person and reminded him of someone dear, saying that he was just like him, showing the silhouette of Tanyu from behind and the iron blood demon, also from behind, who turns around, revealing the same purple eyes that Bira had when invoking his power. Bira remembers the day he separated from his grandfather, known as the iron blood demon who told him to stop trembling and leave. His grandfather would be with him. A younger Bira with tears in his eyes doesn't want to let go of his grandfather, and he wants to go with him too. Returning to the present, Bira, drunk and with tears in his eyes, whispers that he misses him, wondering if he's still alive. Tanyu sees him like this and, to change the situation, asks for his name. The boy tells him his name is Bira, the name his grandfather gave him. Then his attitude changes, and he tells Tanyu he won't tell him, as they won't see each other again. Tanyu laughs and tells him he can count on Bira. He then asks if Bira was fishing earlier, which excites Bira, who suggests they go fishing together before falling asleep from drunkenness. Tanyu removes his cloak and covers the boy. Inspired by the way Bira lives his life without giving up, he takes up his weapon and decides to return to the young lady who set him free and handed over Soil's accessory. Despite having taken his life lightly for a long time, he is determined to return and see his deceased friend's body. Recalling the words the young lady said when they met, that if he caused trouble for the sect again, she would kill him, he leaves, leaving Bira behind, who was dreaming of his grandfather on a fishing day with the bear. The master of Hwamagwan, the name of the city he escaped to, to go to the site of the confrontation where he felt the demonic power. Upon arriving at the tower he had left a few hours ago, is interrupted by a fair-haired girl with a rose in her eye as an eye patch who enters the room and asks where he had been. She mentions that the sisters from the Eastern Fire Demon sect were visiting. The young master apologizes for his absence, explaining that it was an emergency. The three sisters from the fire sect, all of them elderly and very similar in appearance, were enjoying a feast and some liquor. When the young master approaches them, he hands them a fine bottle of wine. They become excited and begin to praise the handsome young man. The young master introduces himself as Banjo Oraboni, a person with great influence in the city and among the sects. They had visited him to inform him about a problem they were having with the Northern Sky Demon sect. Recently, this sect had been inherited by a young leader and some of its members, in protest, had attempted to assassinate her to remove her from power. She killed them and imprisoned everyone involved, except for the children. The problem lies with the fugitive children who had discovered some strange and mysterious arts, injuring the children of the fire sect, even though they had nothing to do with what happened. Banjo states that it's time to clean up the Northern Sky Demon sect, and he turns to his assistant, Choryung, to handle the situation. She leaves the place and approaches a large, robust man who is splitting firewood. She asks him to talk for a moment, and the big man thinks she has accepted his dinner invitation. However, the girl tells him to stop fooling around and that she needs him to locate certain people. The man is tempted to refuse her proposal, but since it's an order from the young master, he is obliged to obey. In a flirtatious manner, he invites her to dinner again, but she rejects him, saying she wouldn't go out with someone who eats larvae. 
He exclaims that they are not larvae but butterflies and then leaves the place with a big jump, exhaling a bunch of green butterflies from his mouth. Two employees who are nearby see the butterflies from the robust man and say they are beautiful but that they would never approach him because he is very careless with his appearance. Choryoung overhears them and gives both women more work as punishment for speaking ill of that man. Returning to the young master and the three sisters, they ask him where he had been a few hours ago. He tells them that he doesn't feel happy talking about it, but the sisters keep insisting. He responds that he felt the presence of an energy similar to that of a pure-blooded metallic demon, referring to Bira. This news leaves expressions of fear and astonishment on the faces of both sisters. Bira, who had sobered up from his drunkenness, begins to follow Taniyu's trail and senses that something is about to go wrong soon, alluding to something the mother bear had told him before she left. Back in the city of H. Wamagwan, the three sisters were enjoying the wine and the views of the city. They also comment on the person who made this city so prosperous, known as Elder Yu Mabik, the older brother of Bira's grandfather, the one who defeated the iron-blooded demon. Changing the subject, the sisters ask the second sister how she allowed the two runaway children to escape. She tells them that she is already quite old, and besides, those children had used an ability that she had never seen in all her years. In her memories, we see the two children, both with a cold and malevolent look, two horns protruding from their foreheads, and a blue aura emanating from the boy's axe. Tan Yu arrives at the ruins of a village in search of his best friend's body but is attacked from the shadows by one of the escaped children who attempts to assassinate him. Tan Yu mistakes him for an ordinary bandit, which angers the boy. Offended, the boy asks how he dares to compare him to a simple bandit. All the while, he attacks Tan Yu with his large axe, stating that it will be an honor for Tan Yu to die at the hands of someone much stronger. Tan Yu remains calm and ignores the boy's words, stopping his attacks and delivering a blow with the side of his halberd. This simple blow causes the boy to fall to the ground and appear ridiculous. Tan Yu decides to ignore him and asks him to find another way to make a living. These words further enrage the boy, who gets up and continues to praise his strength but claims that it won't help him, and that he should become just another puppet in his collection. Tan Yu turns around and sees a blue mist emanating from the boy's axe, surrounding the boy and concentrating a significant amount of energy into his axe. Tan Yu becomes concerned and tries to create some distance between himself and the boy. However, when the boy finishes charging his attack, a much larger energy cloud appears, with several arms holding swords controlled by the boy. The boy starts launching attacks, and Tan Yu can only block a few blows, receiving many more that tear his clothes and armor and causing him some serious injuries. All the while, the boy mocks Tan Yu's weakness and his tough guy attitude and then stops the attack to admire his wounded rival's body, desiring it as a trophy. The leader of the demon sect of the Northern Sky is tracking the other runaway child, specifically the girl who escaped from her using the Lightfoot technique causing the leader's blood to boil, indicating that she won't give her the chance to escape alive. In the ruins of the village, we see smoke rising from the battle, with Tan Yu lying defeated on the ground alongside the boy who had lost the fight but was saved by the other runaway girl. The boy becomes angry with her and hits her in the face for interfering in his fight, referring to her as Yewa. She falls to the ground, terrified by her brother's expression and runs away to hide with tears in her eyes. Meanwhile, the annoyed boy starts using his mist to devour Tanyu's body and add it to his collection of corpses. As Yewa remembers what happened in the battle, the boy had been defeated, and to save him, she took his axe, intensifying the boy's power and defeating Tanyu with a single strike. However, Bira falls from the sky, who was there looking for Tanyu but sees him lying on the ground being devoured by the boy's mist. The boy arrogantly tells him to be patient as he will soon reunite with his friend. Bira becomes angry and begins to unleash his energy, causing panic for the girl who is hiding because she feels Bira's power and knows that the boy is in danger. Bira, in anger, releases a shockwave towards the boy, pushing him away from Taniyu's body and preventing his mist from devouring him. The leader of the sect was close to the village, following the girl's trail when the explosion caused by Bira catches her attention. Returning to the battle between these two, the blue energy of the boy becomes increasingly intense. Human bodies with red masks begin to emerge from the mist, revealing that the hands holding the swords within the mist belong to these strange beings. This power was not used by the boy but by the girl, Yewa, in an attempt to protect her brother from Bira's power. The mist begins to surround Bira, forming a vortex. Trying to get rid of the mist, he sends another shockwave, causing the bodies within the mist to attack him with their swords. He receives the impact and falls to the ground. At that moment, the sisters were discussing the runaway children, 
mentioning the girl's ability to escape from the leader of the demon sect of the northern sky, the Lightfoot Technique. They also describe the boy's ability, which allows him to create human-like puppets to give orders to at his will. One sister mentions that the real danger is not the boy but the girl who accompanies him because, in addition to using the Shadow Step, she can also use the network of dead warriors that her brother uses, but with much more power. This is shown as Bira lies lifeless on the ground, and the girl is holding her brother's axe. Bira has a conversation with his grandfather inside his mind. His grandfather tells him that for several years, he acted selfishly, letting his desires lead him to act on emotions. He is not leaving his life to try to become someone else or be a part of another person's story. After receiving the attack from Yewa, Bira falls to the ground. She looks at him with tears in her eyes, his face dirty and wounded. She approaches the boy, holding her axe. Taniu and Bira had been defeated with a single strike from this girl, showing that she has much more power than the boy but is emotionally weak. Yewa hears a voice in her head, her mother's voice, telling her that her duty is to protect her older brother, Bei Huang, the boy with the axe, who is now kneeling. Her mother's voice continues, saying that her brother will become someone important within the demon sect of the northern sky, and will bring honor to their family. Yewa approaches her brother to hug him, but as she touches his back, he gets angry and shouts at her not to touch him. He reminds her arrogantly of what their mother said proclaiming himself as someone great who will take control of the sect. Filled with rage, Biwing looks at Bira's lifeless body on the ground and raises his axe to deliver a finishing blow. However, before he strikes, the leader of the sect, wearing a dark disguise to conceal her identity, appears. She takes Bira's body to protect him from the attack. Both boys are surprised by what just happened. The sect leader checks Bira's pulse and realizes he's dead but begins to sense a strange energy. An enraged Bihuang launches another attack against the leader, complaining that they've all annoyed him too much. The girl releases Bira's body in a safe place, promising to come back for him, and prepares a resting place. She then unsheathes her sword, which emits a bright white light as it leaves the scabbard. She stops Bihuang's attack with a cross-shaped counterattack that disperses the mist surrounding him. The boys dodge the attack, and with their defenses down, the leader approaches Bihuang. He couldn't see when she got closer and receives a direct blow. She expresses disappointment in Bihuang, expecting more from him as a member of the Death Warriors network. She sends him flying with a single attack, leaving him in the same state as Tanyu or worse. Yewa, seeing her brother wounded and defeated, screams and tries to reach him. The leader comments that it has been three years since they escaped and that they should have stayed hidden in the shadows. The leader removes her mask to reveal her identity to the boys. She is the leader of the demon sect of the Northern Sky, the same person who killed their family for rebelling against her. Yewa, with tears in her eyes, begins to remember the day her entire family was killed. The village was in flames due to the massacre. The leader held Yewa's mother's body, strangling her as she agonized, staring into her eyes, one of them red and malevolent. The leader looks at her again, telling her that she will join her exterminated family. On the day Yewa and Bihuang's family was annihilated by the leader, the mother of the children tells her daughter to protect her brother at all costs, while being strangled by the leader's hand. Her last words before dying were, don't even think about your own life, implying that she should protect Bihuang even if it costs her life. She is then killed by the leader, who explodes the mother's head in front of her daughter. Yewa, looking into her eyes, recalls that tragic day and screams in desperation, trying to escape from the leader. The leader senses her desperation and asks her if she's afraid of death, suggesting that she should have experienced that feeling before. The leader tells Yewa that she will send her back to the arms of her family, who were killed three years ago. As Yewa tries to flee from the leader, the leader positions herself beside Yewa and attempts to cut her in half with her sword. Yewa manages to dodge the attack by jumping. The leader reacts quickly and uses her foot to trip Yewa while she's in mid-air, causing her to fall to the ground. However, despite being knocked down, Yewa continues to run in an attempt to escape from the leader. The leader prepares to launch an attack against Yewa, who approaches her brother's axe. She looks at her brother, who lies defeated on the ground, and decides to use his axe to stop the leader's attack and invoke Beiwang's power. The leader notices that the color of her arm and the color of the axe have changed to a blue hue, with several red eyes opening on her arm and the axe. The girl creates a large amount of blue mist, from which corpses emerge to attack the leader, who is trapped within the vortex created by the mist. The girl sends the lifeless puppets to attack the leader, causing her to retreat. The leader realizes the seriousness of the situation, as a momentary lapse could result in her death at the hands of the girl. 
The lifeless puppets attack the leader, but she can only defend herself and retreat. Meanwhile, Elder, the leader's elderly stag, was heading towards her location and encountered Kyulun, who asked why he was wearing the strange mask. He doesn't know that it's the mask the leader uses to go out without being recognized by anyone. Kyulun also inquires about the sect leader's whereabouts and whether she is nearby. Elder takes the opportunity to inform Kyulun that he will be punished for losing the fight against Tanyu. Changing the subject, he talks about the sound coming from the ruins of Lament, and asks Elder if the leader is in that place. Elder confirms the facts and tells him that he should be there to assist the leader. Meanwhile, in the battle between Yewa and the leader, the leader can only dodge the girl's attacks. Her hair comes undone, causing her sword to glow again, and she takes an offensive stance, unleashing the power of her spiritual sword. She uses one of the techniques from Elder Yumebik, the older brother of Bira's grandfather, launching several crescent-shaped blades towards Yewa, cutting through the puppets and piercing the mist. The girl is hit by several of these blades. Yewa gets up and tries to escape once again, and the leader releases her blades once more. However, she stops them when they are about to hit, as Tanyu's body was in their path. Taking advantage of the leader's distraction, Yewa sees her brother and decides to escape alone. The leader ignores the girl and heads toward Tanyu's body to check if he is still alive. While holding his body, she begins to scold him for always getting into these situations, showing a closeness to Tanyu beyond being an ex-prisoner whose life she spared. She checks his pulse, and indeed, he is still alive, although severely injured. Relieved by the situation, she manages to lift Tanyu's body with great difficulty. Then, a hand grabs the sheath of her sword, repeating bad many times. She turns around and sees Bira, who has risen to grab her sword while repeating bad, bad. The girl can't explain how he is still alive, as when she checked his pulse earlier, he didn't have one, and she had declared him dead. A heavy rain begins to fall everywhere, from the mountains, the forest, and extending into the city. Mother Bear Bora, in search of shelter for her cubs, finds the house of Bira's grandfather, where there are various reeds, baskets, and an accessory that the grandfather used on his head. The bear observes this accessory and then lifts her gaze to the sky, growling in concern for Bira. The rain also falls on the ruins of the village. Bira, holding the sheath of the leader's sword, repeats bad, and vapor emanates from his body. The leader is startled and reacts instinctively by kicking the boy to keep him away from them, causing him to somersault several times in the air, and positioning herself to launch herself at them again while strange vapor emerges from her body. The leader is surprised that the boy endured her kick and tries to apologize to him. But before saying a word, Bira gets up and lunges at the girl, repeating bad once again. The leader reacts and dodges the boy's charge with a jump, causing him to crash into the houses behind her. Tanyu wakes up and says to the leader, Beautiful Sojio, I have something to ask you. The girl blushes and embarrassed, drops him to the ground. Bira charges at her once more, and with Tanyu in her arms, she screams for him to stop. To halt Bira's attack, she uses her arm to block it and notices that he has his eyes closed. Due to the impact of the blow, Sojio's arm fractures, and in an attempt to distance Bira, she kicks him in the neck, sending him flying once more, making him collide with another house in the village alongside Bihuang's body. Taking advantage of having incapacitated the boy, she carries Tanyu's body on her shoulder and leaves the place to find some help for her friend. Bira's body stands up once again and begins to concentrate his energy, causing dark stars to appear, similar to the ones he used against Kulon, while repeating bad once more. Speaking of Kulon, he had encountered his leader and sees her carrying the unconscious body of Tanyu with a fractured arm. While Kulon asks his leader who did this to her and why she keeps saving Tanyu's life and if she has feelings for him, they are interrupted by the commotion caused by Bira who has jumped with great force, ascending to a considerable distance. Sojio and Kyulin turn to see what is happening, and both recognize the boy with surprised expressions on their faces as they watch Bira in the air. In the city of Hwamagwan, young master Banjo, while smoking his pipe, watched the rain falling from his balcony. However, he is interrupted by Choryoung, who says that the clouds are gathering and proceeds to give him research reports. Choryoung mentions that some nobles and priests from the southern region were heading towards the altar of a hundred souls to offer a sacrifice. Banjo becomes intrigued but changes the subject by asking if the elderly women had left. Choryoung tells him that they have, explaining that the elderly women's shoulders were aching due to the rain, so they are taking a bath in the hot springs. He is pleased that the elderly women's mood is improving. He also inquires if there is any news about Hugo, the robust man Choryoung sent to investigate the whereabouts of the leader of the Demons of the Northern Sky sect. 
she tells him that there hasn't been any news about him yet. In a casual tone, Banjo asks about the dinner that Hugo had been offering him, and she responds by telling him to mind his own business and that it's a personal matter. Banjo laughs and asks her not to get angry while he opens a cabinet where a small sword with a red ribbon and a copper-like oxidized color is kept. Choryoung asks why he is taking out such an antique, and Banjo replies that he has a strange feeling about all of this and that he should clean the sword. He draws the sword from its sheath, but there is no blade, only the hilt and the scabbard. Meanwhile, outside the ruins, Kulin tries to stop Bira by using his mental powers, activating his eyes and the snakes on his back. However, since Bira has his eyes closed, he doesn't fall into Kulin's hallucinations and ignores him to go directly towards Sojio. Kulin realizes that the boy has his eyes closed and decides to use another technique to stop him. He takes a flute from his mouth and plays it to activate the snake stored in containers, the same attack he used against Tanu by the river. The snakes surround Bira's body, and Kyulin, thinking he has already won the battle, becomes overconfident. However, seconds after capturing the boy, his snakes shatter and fall to the ground. At that moment, lightning strikes, and a dark energy envelops Bira's right arm. When he falls to the ground, he strikes the earth with his fist, causing the entire area around him to tremble and nearby houses are sent flying. Kulin tries to dodge some debris in the air, but gets hit by one and becomes trapped. The leader sees the destruction Bira is causing and, using her voice, makes the energy sword unsheath itself, covering her with several swords to protect herself and Tanyu, destroying the debris heading their way. The girl escapes the destruction caused by the boy, aiming to take Tanyu to a safe place where they can treat his injuries and prevent him from dying. On the day Tanyu left the sect, he made a promise to his best friend, Soul. He promised that when he became a general, he would return and make Soul his advisor so they could be together in the war. Both pledged to become great people by the time they saw each other again. Sojio responds to all of this by saying that if Tanyu's idea of being a great person involves all this destruction, Bira emerges from the rubble, still pursuing them for a fight with the girl. Sojio, tired of the boy, retracts her sword and decides to engage in combat with him to give him a swift death. Sojio unleashes the power of the sword, preparing an attack called the Sky of the Void. In the distance, Kulin sees this and knows that this ability will harm her as well. Determined to stop her, he approaches her and begins questioning her about her relationship with Tanyu and why she has his accessory. All of this is in the form of a rebuke. The leader only turns to tell him not to cross the line, or it will be his death. As a final act to stop her and prevent her from getting hurt, Kulin tears one of the snakes from his back to bite it, causing his eyes to glow in a very bright orange tone, activating a secret ability. Elder and Tanyu's mount were getting closer to the battle site to help their masters. The elderly animal, tired and complaining, is surprised to see the aftermath of the fight visible from where they are. Returning to Sojio, who is being pursued by Bira, she decides to fight and kill the boy. However, she stops when she sees a large ring of fire opening in the sky, and then finds herself enclosed in one of Kulin's jars. This particular jar, due to Kulin's power, catches fire and starts rolling over her. This is done to create a portal and remove her from the combat zone. A kind of fiery mask forms over her eyes. Kulin tries to distract Bira to gain more time to use his teleportation ability. He sends his jars to distract the boy, who is chasing the one containing the leader and Tanyu. However, this doesn't work as Bira ignores the other jars and continues pursuing the one Kulan is using to fly. He attempts to trap the boy again using his snakes to buy more time. But once again, it proves futile as Bira destroys the jars and heads back towards them. Kulan asks the leader to be patient and assures her that she won't let her out until she's safely out of harm's way. Despite feeling dizzy, Bira lands on the ground and concentrates his dark energy in his fist while Kulin exclaims that he has enough speed to activate the portal swap. In his mind, he acknowledges that he'll fall unconscious after using the ability but doesn't care as long as his leader is safe. As thoughts race through his mind, he realizes he has feelings for Tanyu too, muttering to himself that Tanyu likes her as well. Within the jar, after all the spinning and commotion, she ends up kissing Tanyu while listening to Kulin's words. With tears in his eyes, Kulin activates the portal, sending the leader far away, and the portal closes. He attempts to save her from the Great Fall, revealing that Kulin had only sent their leader, not Tanyu. After the bright flash caused by the explosion of Kulin's last jar, Tanyu's body falls, causing the two to collide heads and snapping Bira out of the strange trance he was in, incapacitating him. Kulin, who was also falling with them, realizes that the boy was not after the leader but rather the dreaded prisoner, referring to Tanyu. 
With no strength left to continue fighting, he falls unconscious along with Tanyu and Bira, leaving all three out of the battle. While the battle unfolded, Hugo, in his search for the young leader, encounters Yewa on his way. He recognizes her and wonders if she's the same girl the sisters were talking about recently. The girl wakes up upon seeing one of Hugo's bright green butterflies, finding him standing in front of her. There's a lot of fire around, and a voice in the background that, upon seeing Bira, shouts, grabbing his attention and making him turn his gaze. As he turns, he beholds a strange creature with long hair covering its entire body, chained in all directions. Within all that hair, a large purple eye becomes visible, reacting upon seeing Bira's eyes, causing large eyes to appear inside the place, all fixated on the boy. The creature's voice yells at him to step back and return at once, waking Bira from the dream he was in. Upon opening his eyes, he finds himself on comfortable ground with a warm and friendly climate, with yellow birds flying overhead. He exclaims that his head hurts, unable to remember anything after drinking Tanyu's wine. Thinking he's at home, he hugs something resembling Baro, the mother bear. While embracing the warm fur of Baro, he exclaims that she needs a bath as she smells like an old person. The creature Bira was hugging wasn't the mother bear but the elderly deer accompanying the leader, known as Elder. Elder exclaims that he feels great with the massages Bira is giving him. Bira is surprised and asks who this creature is. As a voice yells that it's all his fault, Bira turns his gaze to see what's happening and sees Kulin yelling at Tanyu, threatening to kill him and such. And when he's about to strangle Tanyu, we see that his size has reduced considerably, becoming so small that he's no longer terrifying, but rather an adorable creature. Bira asks him who he is and if he knows anything about the old drunk, referring to Tanyu. Kyulan worries that his screams alerted the boy who had destroyed the area some time ago. But in a very Bira-like style, he asks what happened in the place and why it looks that way. Kyulan realizes that the boy doesn't remember anything since last night, clarifying that some time had passed after the battle and he had been asleep all that time. The boy also scolds him for doing that to people while they're sleeping, threatening to punish Kyulan if Tanyu were to wake up. He treats Kyulan as if he were a child, and indeed, his current appearance is that of a small and adorable child. In his thoughts, Kulin calms his anger towards Tanyu, saying he'll have more opportunities to finish him off. But for now, he needs to recover his body. After the attack, he had consumed all his power, leaving him in that state. The main goal is to reunite with the sect leader. Remembering the leader, he recalls the words she said before falling unconscious in the battle, I like you and you bastard. He breaks down in remorse for what he said. Bira doesn't know what happened and asks again what occurred in the place while he scratches the old one's belly. Tanyu, who just woke up at that moment, hugs Bira and thanks him for caring about him and coming to help. Elder mentions that they seem to be very close. Tanyu confirms this and shows his respect for Elder, mentioning his name to him. Elder thanks him for his cordiality and is glad to see him recovered. Tanyu politely asks the elderly deer to tell him his name since everyone refers to him as Elder. The elderly one replies that it's not necessary for him to know as they may not meet in the future. If fate wants it, then he will tell him his name. The boy promises to repay his debt to him, and the elder tells him it's unnecessary. He should focus on staying safe because, for the leader, Tanyu is someone special, even if she doesn't admit it. Tanyu bids farewell to continue with the pending work, which surprises Tanyu a bit since his body wasn't completely healed to travel alone. With a smile on his face, Tanyu squats down and places his hand on Bira's head, saying he has something to check and needs to go alone this time. He promises that when he returns, they will go fishing together and play as much as they want. Bira, with a tough guy attitude, says he doesn't care, but when he returns, he'll have to do everything he asks. Then the boy gets up to bid farewell and leave, leaving the elderly, Tanyu, and Kyulan, who is still crying on the ground. The elder asks where Tanyu is heading, and he cheerfully replies that he's heading to the demonic sky sect in the north. The elder kindly asks him as a favor if he could go to the nearby spring to fetch some fish for him to eat before leaving. Tanyu responds, looking at the ground, with a yes, sir, and runs off with Bira to go fishing together at the nearby spring. The boy tells him to do whatever he needs to do and not to worry at all. Then Tanyu lifts him up and places him on his shoulders, as if they were two brothers. Bira scolds him, saying he's not worried and doesn't care if he comes back home or not, maintaining his tough guy attitude. Then the elder remembers that the rain was falling so heavily as if it would never end. But now the sky is clear. Wondering if the leader made it safely back to the sect, he lowers his gaze and sees the two boys bonding, wondering how long the young one will last, how long he will stay alive. Chenjiang, the center of Master Banjo's city, where he was enjoying a good view from his tower while smoking his pipe. 
His assistant, Choryung, informs the young master that Hugo has returned but couldn't find any trace of the sect leader due to the heavy rains. Banjo is somewhat disappointed as the renowned butterfly tracker returned from his mission empty-handed and asks his assistant to tell Hugo to take a break. He also mentions how good it will be when the old ladies start spreading the rumor about the arrival of the Iron Blood Demon. Choryung asks if it's true that this demon died nine years ago. Banjo confirms this, explaining that the demon was killed by his older brother. Then she asks why he lied to those old ladies about the demon. He tells her it wasn't a lie and not to worry about it, he's just preparing to obtain merchandise. The girl leaves the young master's room and on her way, she meets Hugo, who whispers to her and asks her to come with him. Master Banjo, talking to himself, speculates that maybe it is a lie since the demon everyone fears is already dead. He wonders to whom that strange energy he felt a few days ago belonged, something that no one in the kingdom will forget. The biggest villain known to date, the Iron Blood Demon, who threatened to destroy the world more than once. A name that instills fear in many when uttered. The only person in the world who could stop him was his own brother. They crossed swords eleven times throughout their history. In one of their numerous battles where the demon was defeated, his brother took his eye and half of his life, asking him to live the remaining half humbly on earth. And once again, the demon reappeared before his brother with a mocking laugh, planning to destroy the world by opening the gates of heaven and hell. Nine years have passed since that day, and Master Banjo was also involved in the defeat of the feared demon. He assisted his elder brother in locating the demon, transformed into a white fox, resting on his master's neck like a scarf witnessing firsthand the great battle that was about to unfold. This battle was the last of all, where his master emerged victorious, ending the life of his younger brother, who died with a hole in his chest. In his last words, he told his Hyung Nim to take care of himself, and his lifeless body fell into the abyss. But the problems didn't end there because with his death, the giant monster he had brought remained. This creature, in the form of a massive serpent, opened its mouth and eyes that appeared all over its body to devour everything in its path, making the whole world feel the fear of the world's destruction. Master Banjo comments that nine years have passed since that terrifying moment, and maybe it's his obsession with the demon. Recalling the day of his death, he didn't see a bloodthirsty, heartless demon but the eyes of a person with a clear conscience, as if they were a child's eyes. Meanwhile, Hugo guides Choryung to a small storeroom where Yewa, the runaway girl who escaped the sect massacre, is hiding. In the pond where the boys were fishing for the elderly deer, Tanyu is unable to catch a fish effectively. In a drowsy tone, Bira asks if he's going to keep trying to catch just one fish. Tanyu replies that when he was a child, he caught many fish with his friend Soel and trusted himself a little. Bira changes the subject and asks if he was looking for his friend before. Before answering his question, Tanyu catches his first fish. Bira can't believe he caught a fish using such a strange fishing method, saying that the elder will love his fish. Responding to his earlier question, he tells him about the promise he made with his friend when they were children. Once he becomes a general, he'll come back for him and make him his subordinate. Bira says if he wasn't the subordinate already because the uniform he was wearing looked like that of an ordinary soldier. With absolute confidence, Tanyu affirms that his friend is still waiting for him, and if what the miss said was true, he would offer a wine in his honor. Bira, in his own style, breaks the atmosphere by asking if his friend was as much of an idiot as he was for making such a cheesy promise. Then they leave the place in search of fruit, as no deer they know eats fish, leaving Tanyu embarrassed as he drops the fish out of shame. Returning to the sect leader, who was on her way to the demonic sky sect after the battle, and being transported by her subordinate. The old deer finds her and is sent back to the sect by the elder's companion, who stays behind to tend to Kulun's injuries. Due to the continuous spinning inside the vessel, she had become dizzy and fell unconscious. She worries about her subordinates and the power the girl had used, as this was the final form of the network of dead warriors, an ability that controls the lifeless bodies of her enemies. The leader feels that a great calamity will soon befall this girl, and in the distance, the first views of the sect city appear. A great city in black and gold, surrounded by a great dark serpent that extends throughout the city. Soldiers from the sect find her on the arrival route and approach her. She asks them if the leaders have arrived, and they respond that they are in a meeting right at that moment. Returning to the elder, he tries to comfort young Kulin by asking when he will return to the leader. Young Kulin says he can't show himself to her in that weak form he has now because after the battle, his body had shrunk considerably, to the point of looking like a small child. Whimpering, he tells the elder that he must first regain his stronger form before meeting with the leader. After crying so much, young Kulin runs out of energy and falls into a deep sleep. 
The elder takes advantage of the moment to take a little nap while the boys go get some food. Near one of the ruined houses, a dark silhouette watches them while they sleep, with large green eyes fixed on young Kyulan. Meanwhile, the boys were picking fruit to feed the elderly deer, arguing as if they were a pair of brothers. A little bird approaches Bira, shouting that there is a thief in the forest who took its treasure it had saved for a wedding. The boy replies that it probably left it somewhere else, and the little bird responds that it saw the thief take its precious treasure. Bira tells it to hurry and catch the thief before he escapes, and the bird obeys and flies away to stop the culprit. Tanyu approaches Bira with a lot of fruit in his arms. The boy would ask if it was the elder who healed his wounds and that he is determined to repay his debts. Bira tells him that he should live a very long life because he has many debts to pay, addressing Tanyu as Hyom. While approaching the ruins, they hear the elder's voice shouting, looking for young Kyulan, who had disappeared. The old man, worried, asks the boys to help him find the child. Both boys split up, Tanyu returns the way they came, and Bira goes into the forest in search of young Kyulan. As he runs through the forest, he sees the little bird from earlier. It was attacking a strange furry creature with a beak-shaped mask on its back. Bira observes the creature and realizes that it has young Kulan on its back. Determined to recover him, he reprimands the creature for stealing and, even worse, kidnapping people. The creature notices his presence and tries to escape, but Bira stops it with a kick to its torso, sending it flying and rescuing young Kulan, who is still asleep. The boy turns his back to leave, and the creature gets up from the ground, tears streaming from its eyes and its body trembling. Then, it screams loudly and pursues the boy. Bira stops and faces the creature to confront it. The creature screams again, causing it to expel some strange stones from its mouth. These were the jewels belonging to the little bird, as it had been the thief who took its treasure and had also kidnapped Kyolan. The boy realizes what this creature had done and is about to launch an attack when it starts screaming again. This makes Bira fall to his knees. This scream had induced a drowsy state in the boy, causing him to fall asleep. The creature stands in front of him, shedding tears and drool from its beak-shaped mask. Back in the city of young Master Banjo, a strange tree walks through the city streets, causing a commotion among the people because, more than being a simple tree, it had a person attached to it. This person, attached to the tree, walks through the city, holding his sword and repeating several times, Iron Blood Demon, and asking where he was. Master Banjo would be resting in his tower, but he is interrupted by his assistant, who, concerned and agitated, asks him to go to the city center. There is something causing a commotion among the residents and merchants of the place, who only kept repeating that they would take care of killing the Iron Blood Demon. Meanwhile, the creature from the forest had captured Bira and Kyulan, carrying them on its back, with Bira tied to a rope and holding young Kulan in its arms. It kept saying Muo, wherever it went, causing every creature that heard it to fall asleep. Back in the city, the young master heads to the city center to find the tree man who was causing panic among its inhabitants. Showing kindness to the strange adventurer, he offers to take him somewhere he can rest without scaring away the merchants. However, the man would only respond if Banjo had been the last person to see the Iron Blood Demon. The master denies it, saying it's all a misunderstanding and that he had never seen such a demon. In a calm tone, the strange man orders the city master to leave and search for the said demon. Otherwise, he would not allow any more business to be conducted in the city. The master apologizes, saying he couldn't fulfill that request, and asks him to please leave the city. The man raises his sword against the city master. Banjo reacts quickly and moves his assistant out of the attack range of the man. The man's intention was not to attack the master but to destroy the houses around him, causing great damage to the city, threatening the young master to bring the said demon within two days, otherwise, he would personally take care of his precious city. All this happened because of the rumor spread by the young master, something that his assistant would also reproach him for at that moment, for spreading such a lie. Banjo seems to accept the orders of the tree man. Returning to the elder and Tanyu, who can't locate young Kulan, the elder apologizes for keeping him as he was in a hurry to leave for a job. Tanyu says it's not a problem since he has a debt to repay to him and offers some fruit he had obtained in the forest earlier. In the blink of an eye, the food would disappear from their hands, and loud snores would be heard nearby. Turning their gaze toward the source of the sound, they see the strange creature eating the fruit while holding Bira and Kulan on its body. Tanyu's cries, asking what the monster is doing with the kids, make it scared, and it runs away from the place. The elder and Tanyu run after them, wondering what kind of creature that is and why it had kidnapped the children. The old man would exclaim that the creature is quite fast and that if it weren't so hungry, he could catch up to it in no time. Tanyu tells the old man to wait while he goes to capture it, 
but the elder refuses and wants to help the kids. Tanyu rushes ahead, shouting at the creature to stop, as there was a large cliff right in front of them, and he was concerned about the well-being of both children. But the creature ignores him and makes a tremendous leap over the cliff, so significant that it looked like it was flying, and slowly descends into the depths of the forest. Tanyu, surprised by the enormous leap and worried about the kids, thinking they might have been injured in the fall. Below the mountain, a group of merchants heading to the city of Hwamagwen to relax and rest from their long journey suddenly sees the creature that had kidnapped Bira and Kulan land in one of their jewelry carriages, swallowing some of the jewels. Tanyu, who had just arrived on the road, sees the chaos caused and, in the distance, spots the strange creature. Upon noticing his presence, the creature continues to flee, leaving Tanyu behind with the merchants. The boy moves through the crowd of armed merchants to chase the creature, but is stopped by the leader of the merchants who confuses him and thinks he is one of the companions of the ruffian who escaped. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, Hugo would bring some food to the girl he had found during his search, giving her a place to hide and recover from her injuries. Once he leaves the food and chats briefly with the girl, saying that no one goes to that warehouse except him, he departs, leaving the girl in her hiding spot. She eyes the food with suspicion and is also somewhat hungry but decides to reject it and escape from the place. Both boys woke up from their long sleep caused by the creature's sounds, realizing that they were at the base of a tree, as if it were a shelter from the creature. The creature was sitting next to them, holding Kulan in its arms. The boy began to ask the creature why it had kidnapped them and brought them to that place. In his most depressing moment, Kulan started saying nonsensical things, like if he died, the moon would still shine and other such dramatic phrases. On the other hand, Bira scolded him, saying that everyone was worried about him and that it was his fault that he was also involved in this problem. The creature began to murmur moo moo moo, the only sound that came out of its mouth or beak. That's when Bira realized that after hearing that sound earlier, he had fallen into a deep sleep, and the best option now was to wait for the perfect moment to escape with Kyulon. The boy's stomach rumbled with hunger since he hadn't eaten anything since the previous day. The creature heard this and started regurgitating some of the food it had stolen from Tanyu a while ago, then offered it to both children. While Kulan continued to complain and say depressing things, the creature brought the saliva-covered food to the kids to eat. Bira took the food reluctantly but decided to pretend to eat a bit to avoid alerting the creature. In contrast, Kulan ate the fruit covered in saliva and continued to say depressing things. The creature watched as both kids ate and made a small smile of happiness, murmuring moo moo moo. Bira wondered to himself what that word meant and why the creature was smiling like that. After eating, Kulan asked for more from the strange creature. The creature got up and left the tree, asking Bira to climb on its back again. The boy tried to refuse, but the creature threatened to put him to sleep again. Without an option, he decided to climb onto its back since he was tired and hungry. In his current state, he couldn't do much, so he decided to cooperate with the creature that had kidnapped them. Once Bira got on its back, the creature began to run very fast through the forest again, jumping from one place to another. Meanwhile, in another part of the forest, the old man and Tanyu had been captured by the merchants who mistook them for the thieves who had robbed them a while ago. The boy would complain to the leader, saying that they had nothing to do with the creature, and asked for some water for the old deer, who hadn't eaten or drunk anything for a while. The old man asked Tanyu not to worry about him and apologized for being a burden. Tanyu responded that it was not his fault, and that he was not a burden. Instead, he felt indebted and believed he should repay him without making excuses. The merchants told them to be quiet, saying that they should be thankful they hadn't been killed after stealing their belongings. The boy tried to deny again what they were being accused of. The leader of the merchants responded that it was not the time to talk, and they still wouldn't give them any water if they were thirsty. The boy and the old man continued to talk about the situation and the deer said that both kids were safe because he hadn't sensed any malice in the creature that had taken them. He also mentioned that in Cullen's case, he might not be as weak as they thought. Once again, the mercenaries told them to be quiet, threatening to hit them if they didn't keep silent. Back with the children, they were escaping on the creature's back from a swarm of angry bees that stung them many times. Vera complained to the creature that if it was going to steal honey, it should do it properly. Once they got rid of the bees, the creature eyed a large fruit, a bit bigger than Kulan in his current child form. It moved towards it, but Vera warned it not to and to stop. However, they were eaten by a carnivorous plant. 
but they were quickly released by the sound emitted by the creature, causing everyone around, including the plant, to fall asleep. The boy woke up again and, with half-open eyes, saw the creature climbing a tree to pick some fruits for the kids. But for a moment, when the sunlight dazzled his eyes for a few seconds, he saw the figure of a boy smiling instead of the strange, furry creature with a beak. Then, he was hit by the fruits falling from the tree while the creature smiled sweetly and teased the boy. Young Kulin found the situation fun, but Bira was having a hard time and asked to let him sleep a little longer. As the sun set, the children and the creature were back at the tree, resting after a long day of running through the forest. The creature was deeply asleep, and Bira tried to take advantage of the moment to escape with the little Kulon. However, when he looked at Kulin's face, he saw him smiling while asleep, wondering what this creature might be dreaming about. The boy calmed down a bit and decided to lie down on the creature's back to sleep a little longer since he was full and wanted to regain his energy. Back in the city, the young master would be closely monitoring the strange tree man to ensure that he didn't scare away more merchants or commit any other madness. His assistant informed him that he had already sent messengers to all his merchants explaining the situation regarding the man obstructing the entrance. They also talked about the request the man had made. The girl believed that the demon they were talking about no longer existed, and it was impossible to fulfill what the man was asking for. The master was only wondering why that strange man was looking for the iron blood demon. This man, who was in the middle of the city entrance, surrounded by the debris he had caused a few hours ago, was resting and dreaming about a tragic day. It was a dark night, and chaos was rampant in the city. The boy was desperately searching for his brother everywhere. When he found him, he saw his brother lying on the ground with his legs completely destroyed. The boy was agonizing and with tears in his eyes. He told his brother that he was okay, that it wasn't his fault, and he didn't want to see him cry. He told him that the real culprit for all this was the feared iron blood demon. The appearance of this man's brother was very similar to what Bira saw for a moment in the creature. In other words, both the creature holding them and the tree man are brothers and seem to have some kind of curse upon them. The man woke up screaming with tears of blood in his eyes after finishing his dream. The branches of his body began to grow violently, covering almost his entire body as he shouted that he would kill the iron blood demon. At the same time, the creature that was with the children also woke up. It seemed to sense its brother's scream and also shouted with anger, causing its fur to grow considerably, and its eyes to shine brightly. All the commotion woke up Bira, who was covered almost entirely by the creature's fur. With the night upon them, the merchants decided to camp and regain their strength to continue their journey the next day. The old man and Tanyu were sitting on the edge of the camp, eating some bread that the merchants had given them. Tanyu complained about how hard the bread was, while the old man enjoyed the food, thanking the merchants who replied that he didn't need to thank them since it would be sold once they reached the city. Tanyu expressed his concern for the children to the old man, and he replied that they needed to eat if they wanted to rescue them. For now, they had to do what the merchants told them. The boy saw in the distance how the creature that had kidnapped the children hours ago was flying over the trees at high speed. Tanyu commented to the old man, and he, having also seen them, broke free from the restraints that held him prisoner, and asked Tanyu to quickly get on his back. Despite being an old man, he ran very fast and managed to free himself from the merchants who had held them captive, and they once again began to pursue the creature, but this time with full stomachs. The merchants, unable to do anything, watched as they made a great leap towards the precipice, leaving them behind with no prisoners. With no other option, they decided to ignore them and continue resting, as they needed to reach the city as soon as possible to avoid another assault. Back at the Northern Demonic Sky Sect, the high-ranking members and their leader were discussing the situation regarding the girl who had escaped. The one who possessed a forbidden ability that could cause a lot of trouble if Master Banjo were to find out about it. The sect's high-ranking members blamed her since she was supposed to have annihilated that entire family, and the fact that the only survivor could use such a powerful ability put them in danger. The leader admitted that it was her fault and ordered trackers to go after the girl, stating that her capture was of utmost importance at this moment. She also ordered them to find the person who influenced the murder, the man named Tanyu. This last order was given in secret by the leader, and the high-ranking members remained silent as they left to carry out their young leader's orders. Returning to the city of H. Wamaguan, the girl who had escaped from Hugo's warehouse was wandering through the city's alleys. From a high vantage point, she saw in the distance the large tree sprouting from the back of the strange traveler who had arrived hours ago. People around her began to evacuate the area on Master Banjo's orders to avoid civilian casualties if a battle were to break out. The young master, fascinated by the large tree growing from the man's back, was confronted by his assistant, 
who reproached him for spreading rumors that would attract more strange people like this man who were searching for the Iron Blood Demon. Just at the right moment, the merchants whom the young master had called arrived at the scene to assist him. There was the cook Doyle, the seamstress Chen Jian, and the cremator Suan. They all told the master that they had heard that this person had arrived after the young master had spread rumors about the demon. He apologized to them and said that he would explain the situation later, and for now, they should take care of stopping this man. For a moment, the young master remained silent and asked his merchants if the person behind them had come with them. As they all turned around, they were met with the strange creature with a beak and long hair, the same one that had kidnapped the children hours ago. The tree man remembers the first day when this creature appeared to him. It was nighttime, and he was exhausted from a recent battle in which he had just killed two individuals. At that time, he only had a branch growing from his back. The creature appeared in front of him, causing fear and desperation. This desperation still persists to this day because upon seeing this monster again, he becomes agitated, causing his branches to grow uncontrollably, wreaking havoc in the city. The creature regurgitates something from its stomach, but it's not clear due to the slime surrounding it. However, the creature offers it to him. The desperate man yells at it to stay away from him, causing him to be almost completely covered by the branches of his tree. With tears in its eyes, the creature tries to approach him to deliver what it has in its arms, attempting to calm him with the sound it produces. The young master realizes the danger of the situation and decides to flee the scene with his merchants. The tree's branches grow so much that they are visible from the other side of the city. Hugo sees this and notices that they are sprouting from the place where the merchants are gathered, and Choryung is there. Determined, he goes to help his beloved. At that moment, the old man and Tan Yu were arriving in the city. From where they are, they see the tree's branches growing uncontrollably and deduce that the creature they are pursuing is likely at the base of the tree with the children. They also head to the scene to rescue the children and prevent them from getting hurt. Meanwhile, at the base of the tree, it's chaos. The merchants escape from the uncontrollable branches, and the creature tries to communicate with the tree man. The young master passes by the creature carrying his friend, and he notices the child on the creature's back. Gewa, trying to escape from the tree's branches, becomes entangled in one of them, while the cook, who is on the roof of one of the houses holding his long kitchen spoon, has it taken away by Taniyu, but he doesn't notice it. The massive branches wreak havoc throughout the city, causing a lot of destruction in their path. But suddenly, the branches seem to calm down for a moment. The seamstress and the cremator pause for a few seconds to contemplate the terrifying sight of the big tree and talk a bit about the atrocities they have faced in the past. With the cremator mentioning that she hasn't seen anything terrifying yet and still lacks experience, the young girl wonders if the strange creature, which she refers to as a furball, was heading towards the big tree. The woman replies that she doesn't know but that it seems like when the tree saw this creature, it went mad out of nowhere. The cook joins them, asking if they happened to see his spoon, as he doesn't know if he lost it or if it was stolen. The young master also arrives at the scene to try to come up with a plan to stop this catastrophe that is happening. They try to calm down and, taking advantage of the momentary peace, they prepare to have a light meal so they won't fight on an empty stomach. Meanwhile, deep within the tree, Tanyu is stuck among the branches. Suddenly, he hears a voice whispering various things, but the most important one is to catch the iron blood demon. The voice becomes louder as if it were getting closer to him. In a moment of silence, a hand lifts one of the branches covering Tanyu, revealing a person wearing a strange demon mask. The person claims to have found the iron blood demon upon seeing Tanyu. And that's how the first part of this manhwa ends. If you have reached this part of the video, let me tell you that you have been one of the few people to make it here. So comment the word bear in the comments. Remember to subscribe to not miss any videos. With that said, see you in the next video.